Good morning, everyone. If you'll grab your hymn books, please, and turn to number 356, Redeemed. 356, we'll sing all four stanzas together. So if you found 356, please stand with me and let's sing it together. see you this morning glad that you're here and I trust the Lord will bless us in our worship today would you take your Bibles please and turn to Proverbs the very first chapter please I'm going to refer back to a verse that we see here so kind of think about what we're reading very beginning of Proverbs brother Randy will lead us and he'll read through verse number seven The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the words of understanding, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness and justice and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion, that the wise man may hear and increase in learning, and that the man of understanding may attain unto sound counsels. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of Jehovah is the beginning of knowledge, but the foolish despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. Most holy God, we come before you this morning to worship you and praise you. I pray that you will give David the words that we need to hear this morning and that you will cause us to hear and understand. All this I ask in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate that. Uh, turn in your hymn books once again to 511, please. Number 511, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. Um, we'll sing all five stanzas together. So if you found 511, please stand with me and let's sing it together. Mm -hmm. 
Open our Bibles, please, to the letter of 2 Timothy. Paul's letter to 2 Timothy, or to Timothy, his second letter to him. So glad that you're here from our beautiful children and young people to all of our families and adults and those who are watching by live streaming. We're just glad that you're with us. And I trust that the Lord will bless your heart and make his gospel real in your lives. Our text today will be 
in verses 6 through 8, but I want to begin with the first verse and read down through verse number 8. If you would, please look with me. Paul said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, and without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Now here are our verses. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to to the power of God. You'll notice that in verse 5, Paul talks about being filled with joy. So this is a section, these opening verses, I think, that are rather lighthearted, that Paul is uh, uh, feeling good as he writes to Timothy. But when we move into verse 6 and 7 and 8, we move into a little bit of a darker look at things because Timothy, Paul seems to think, is wavering. The pressure that he's under is getting to him. And now he's not vacillating with regards to Christ or the gospel, but he's vacillating due to what is required to faithfully preach the gospel with clarity. And so he's struggling, and Paul writes to him. It seems to me there are three factors that have been brought to bear on Timothy. First of all, Paul himself, his father in the faith and his mentor in the gospel, is now firmly ensconced in the Roman prison. Not just the first time where he was housed in a sort of come and go situation where he could easily have people in to see him and he could preach and he could talk and even the guards uh, who were watching him listened and he was there for a couple of years even but he had rather a relative freedom but no longer is he experiencing that now he's a little older and he's now in the place of maximum security He's now uh, being held by the Roman government and he is at the Mamertine dungeon as you've heard me speak of it. And furthermore, he's been there long enough that he's failed his first attempt to explain that he is not uh, in opposition to the Roman government. And so he's firmly planted there. And so I think when this news spread abroad, that it uh, was like a stake in the heart of Timothy. But there's a second thing that's going on, and that is that not only is the persecution against Timothy, against Paul, very real, but persecution is spreading throughout the Roman Empire. And the closer you got to Rome, the closer it was. And the, the bigger your name was, the more likely you were to be under persecution. And the bigger the city you were, the more likely you were to be under persecution. Well, he's in Ephesus, and he is a direct protege of Paul. And so Timothy is in a very uh, difficult situation. Nero, the emperor, has entered the scene. And Nero is out of his mind. He's mad. He's 
paranoid, thinks that everybody is out to get him. He thinks that everybody's trying to undo his authority and overcome the Roman Empire. He is what we would call today an obsessive, compulsive personality. He is a sick, sick man. But the third thing is that the fire that's within Timothy, that he has known now for a number of years, is ebbing low. It's burning low. It's sort of an ember. It's not low regarding Christ, I don't think, or the gospel of grace, but it's that boldness to stay strong, to stay clear, to stay firm, to stay resolute. It is now being hard to come by. He's facing these various pressures. So what we see when we come to verse number 6 is Paul says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance. And so what Paul is going to do is he's going to use three things to try to encourage Timothy. So he called Timothy, first of all, number one, to look within. Now these are words that are not only good for Timothy, but these are words that are good for you. These are the words that are good for me. He tells him to first of all look within. And he tells him in verse 6 to stir up the gift of God which is in thee. Now the word stir is a word that means to rekindle. It's like a fire. So you've been out before where you've had a, had a fire and you have little embers that are uh, down underneath. The fire has gotten low, but you still have some embers. And so you may blow on it. Or if you have a, a little bellows, you might blow the bellows on there. And then you find some little tender twigs and you put those tender twigs on there and you're trying to get that fire to come back. Well, that's what's happening with Timothy. Paul is not giving him a harsh admonition, but rather he's giving him a gentle reminder as a fellow worker in the gospel, to remember and stir up the gift of God. Look within and stir up. And fire is a symbol that's used for God's ministers. I could go back into the Old Testament as well, but let me just look in the New Testament a couple of places. Uh, early on, Jesus said in Matthew 3 and verse 3, or actually John the Baptist said about Jesus, that he, Jesus, shall baptize you with water, with the Holy Spirit, and uh, with uh, fire. Not water, but with fire. Or it may be translated with the Holy Spirit and even with fire. Sometimes the word and can be even. So with the Holy Spirit and even with fire. But it's the symbol of burning within, the desire to bring the gospel. And then in Acts chapter 2, where we have the beginning of the church age past the original apostles and the beginning of the time uh, in Acts and it's called tongues of fire that come upon them. It's an allusion to them speaking, speaking within with a fire that's within. So this, this young preacher has now become a mature preacher and he's struggling with the fire that's within. Listen to a verse from the Old Testament. This is about Jacob, who has lost his son Joseph, and then his other sons go to where Joseph is, and then they come back to Jacob and listen to what it says. And they told him all the words of Joseph. So Joseph spoken to his 11 brothers, which had been, which had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, it says, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. Well, that word revived is the same idea that we have here of being stirred up. Now, everything begins from within. I don't care if, you're, uh, if it's a job you have or if it's playing basketball on a basketball team uh, or if it's, in my case, preaching the gospel or Timothy's case, preaching the gospel. Everything begins within. You have to have that fire within. 
Coach can't give that to you. Your boss cannot give that to you. You cannot give it to me. It has to reside within me. And it had to reside within Timothy. So he told him to look within. Because he needed to know that his preaching was not a profession, but a calling. It was an appointment of God that God had given to him. So the first thing he does is he tells him to look within. Here's the second thing that he tells him to do. He tells him to look back. So not only look within, but then to look back. So read on in verse 6. He said, stir up the gift of God, meaning the gift to preach, the gift to be a pastor. And then he told him to look back, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. He told him to look back. Paul reminded him that his gift to ministry and his ordination to the gospel ministry was a gift of God. And the laying on of hands was not magical and it was nothing more than symbolic. But it was the gentle laying on of the hands of the apostles or the presbytery as we might say. Then of ordained men as time went on in more recent time to those who are called of the gospel. Paul refers to this in 1 Timothy also chapter 4 and verse 4. But it's also referred to in Acts 6 where the deacons were set apart and they laid their hands upon them. And also is referred to in Acts 13 where Paul is set apart with Barnabas. Do you remember that? And they laid their hands upon them to the ministry that God had called them. And so it was the church laying their hands upon them to confirm that this calling was from God, but it was to lay their hands upon their head and a gentle word to them to say that you're praying for them. God bless you in your work and in your ministry, and he's reminding him of that. Probably he's referring back to the whole event that we have recorded for us in Acts the 16th chapter, beginning in verse 1, where Paul comes back through his, to, through his neighborhood and uh, he's been there before on the first preaching tour. Now he comes back through and this whole event of him being uh, set apart to the gospel ministry and he goes with Paul. So as believers, as believers, we need to always look back to what drew us to Christ. So I'm sure in your mind, as I do in mine, I go back over and I think about the events that took place and I still have the feelings, do you? Still have those feelings in my heart, in my mind, as to what drew me away from my false religion and what brought me to the knowledge of Christ. This year, 67, almost 68, I've been preaching for 50 years. Well, I can go back to those 50 years and I still can have the sense that I had when I was just just a young guy. And then the journey. What a journey it's been for me along the way. Big change took place not until I was 38, but basically 20 years later from that point. But oh my goodness, the feeling to look back and to think about it. And so that's what he's doing. He's telling him to look within. And then I want you to look back and then what's the third thing he tells him to do? In verse 7 and 8, he tells him to look up. So now what he does in verse 7 and 8 is he reminds Timothy of the inner life that is necessary and he's going to give him five truths. So you, you may want to write these down because I think these would be helpful to you. He tells him, to look within, he tells him to look back, and now he tells him to look up, and now he's going to give him five truths about looking up to God. It's what he said in verse 7, For God hath not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. Verse 7 and 8 both begin with a negative. God has not given us the spirit of fear. 
And then verse 8, be not therefore ashamed of the gospel. So these two negatives Paul used to launch into these five positive things that are going to be said. So here's the first one. You want to write these down. These will, this will be helpful to you tomorrow now. First of all, God gave the Spirit who guards against fear. God gave the Spirit, His Spirit, who guards against fear. Now, when He first uses this word Spirit, and that God has not given us the Spirit of fear, no doubt He's talking about that which resides within man as the inner power of man, the spirit of man. We don't exactly understand all the makeup of man. You'll hear people uh, act like they really understand exactly what we are. We know that we are a body. We know that we are a spiritual person. We know that we are psychological. We know that we have feelings. We know that we have a will. But the scripture also speaks of man having a spirit. So here it is this spirit that he's talking about, but by contrast, Paul doesn't say it, but by contrast, he's making an allusion to the Holy Spirit. So God has not given to us the spirit of fear. Now what is the word for fear here? Well, there's one word for fear that is used in the scripture, which is the word phobia, which we get the word phobia from. That's a word fear that kind of overcomes you. But this is the word that, it's a different word, delius is the word, and it means timidity or cowardice. So God has not given to us the spirit of timidity or the spirit of being a coward. Now, natural fear is something that all of us have and we ought to have. For example, I'm afraid to touch a hot stove. I know better than to touch, to touch a hot stove. You can't see a stove whether it's hot or not. In our, ours, we don't have a fire burning. It's electric. And uh, it can be hot and you can't tell it. So I'm cautious about touching it. That's fear. I don't, I'm not ashamed to tell you. I'm afraid of touching that stove. I want to find out if it's hot or not. I'd be afraid of jumping off of a high cliff if I didn't have something to hold me up. If I'm on a hundred foot cliff, I know better than to jump off. I have a certain fear about doing that. I have a fear of disappointing people. I, I don't want to disappoint you or others. There's a fear inside of me that I would disappoint you. This afternoon, I'm going to drive in several hours of fast traffic. There'll be traffic on my right, in front of me, behind me, on my left. There'll be big trucks speeding people. I have a certain fear about driving in that speeding traffic. We could talk about a thousand things that we all have certain fears about. Our fears protect us. I would say to you also that there is a spiritual fear that is healthy. If a person has a blissful sense about facing God without the knowledge of the truth of the gospel, he has no fear. Of God seems to me that person doesn't have good sense just like you ought to have good sense not to jump off of a cliff you ought to have good sense about facing God and knowing who he is that didn't we read a few moments ago that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge that's the ABC's of life the ABC's of life that's the beginning a is where you begin and the ABCs of life would be that the fear of God is something we all ought to have. And the fact is, he that fears God the most loves God the best. So the fear of God is something we all ought to have. So there's natural fear and there's spiritual fear. Paul is talking about another kind of fear. He spoke of the kind of fear that led to withdrawal from boldly preaching the gospel. You don't, and I don't have many friends, or many relatives, maybe none, that believe the gospel. And it's paralyzing to us if we are afraid and we pull back rather than 
and press forward. Well, that's what he's telling Timothy. Your task is to preach the gospel. Don't let the difficulties and the trials be so captivating to you that you do not persistently resist and move forward. Now, had Timothy been a fatalist, Timothy would conclude, I have fear, and God gave it to me. That's what a fatalist would say. However, he's not a fatalist. He's a sovereign, grace believer and preacher. Therefore, he resisted the spirit of fear. God has not given to us the spirit of fear. Did Timothy have it? He sure did. That's why Paul spoke it to him, spoke that to him. But God didn't give it to him. God didn't give it to him. There are people who are fatalists that think that everything that comes into their mind, God gave it to them. Every sin they commit, it's God's doing. But that's not so. God didn't give it to us the spirit of fear, and he's not the author of sin. That is something that he said God didn't do that for. He was a gospel preacher. He resisted that spirit of fear. He resisted the sin. And he prayed for boldness in the face of these terrifically pressurized circumstances that he was under. There's a parable that Jesus gave of the parable of the talents. And the one man said, I was afraid and I went and hid my talent, my money, in the earth. Well, that's the very wrong thing we ought to do is to be afraid and to hide. So I say to you, the first thing is that God gives to us not the spirit of fear, but the spirit who guards against fear. Here's the second thing that I see in our text, and that is that God gave the spirit who produces power. God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power. Now, power here stands in contrast to spirit of fear. So not the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power. And this word power is that normal word that you've heard me speak of, of dunamis. And it is that power that resides within the church and does not depart from the church. And I'm just going to give you several things that God gives us the power to. First of all, there's the power of confession. We cannot confess Christ According to 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3, except we have the Spirit of God. And then there is the power of a spiritual consciousness, which Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 8 and in verse 16. The Spirit resides within. We walk by the Spirit. And then in Romans 5 and verse 5, the knowledge of God's love. By the Spirit who is in us, we have the knowledge of God's love. Then by the Spirit who is in us, we have peace and the joy of faith. Romans 14 and verse 17, also 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6, you might look at. He also gives us the spirit of hope in Romans 15 and verse 13, a beautiful verse about having hope. And then of following Him. In Romans 8 and verse 4 and 5, He talks about walking after the Spirit, according to the Spirit, according, in contrast to walking after the flesh. And then in Romans 7 and verse 6, it talks about walking in the newness of the Spirit. So the Spirit of God who resides within us is the Spirit who is the Spirit of power. So He's given us the Spirit that guards against fear, the Spirit who produces power, and now, here's number three, he gave the spirit who yields love. Look what he said. God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love. In Galatians 5 and 22 and 23, first thing he said, the fruit of the spirit is love. God gives us love. In 1 John 4 and verse 18, he says, perfect love casteth out fear. Now, the only thing perfect I've ever done is sin. I've never perfectly loved. He's not talking about my love. 
He's talking about the love of God. It's the love of God that is perfect, and it is that love that casteth out fear. So we rest in His love. We look to His love. It is that love that is within us. And Jesus showed that He had this perfect love and reverence to God. You can read of that in Hebrews 5 and 7. You see, my time's running out, so I'm moving along a little faster. And so, God gave the Spirit that God guards against fear, that produces power, that yields love. Here's number four. God gave the Spirit who generates sanity. If I knew very much about this, I could talk about it a long time, but look what he said. He said, also the spirit of a sound mind. I can tell you what it means. I don't know much about it, but I can tell you what the words have to do with. The root word for here is here is the word phronia, and it is a word that has to do with the mind or thinking. It's thinking. And he refers to being carnally minded in Romans 8, 6. And there he also refers to being spiritually minded. There's another verse in 1 Timothy where he talks about being sober minded. Very kindred word. Paul uses this same word also in Acts 26 and 25 where he says, I am not mad. I am not insane, uh, because that's what he thought he was for believing the gospel. They thought that he was insane. But this word, sound mind, a healthy mind, means an inner self-government. An inner self-government. So the more a person loses their sanity, the more they lose their inner self-government. This inner self-government, is characteristic of one who is governed by the Spirit of God. It's to be settled in Christ. It's to be settled in the doctrine that results in biblical behavior and solid conduct. Don't tell me when you've had uh, bad behavior that you're being led by the Spirit of God. That's not so. God has not given to us the spirit of fear or of weakness or of hate or of an unhealthy mind. He has given to us the spirit of a sound mind. This sound mind guides, guides with courage and with power and with love. So whatever you have, whatever you're doing in life, do it this way. God gave the spirit who guards against fear, who produces power, who yields love, who generates sanity, and here's the last one. God gave the Spirit who causes action, who motivates to action. That's what verse 8 is about. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. The word ashamed means to pull back. So it's very much like this word that we saw up here before uh, this idea of fear. It's pulling back. Jesus said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, he shall not, uh, he shall not come, he shall not uh, uh, be with me and when my Father and his angels send me. In, in Romans uh, chapter 1 and verse 15 and 16, so as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to them that are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God. You see, the power of God and this absence of shame go together. But the key word in this verse, if you were going to say what the key word is, what is it? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It is the word partaker. But be thou partaker. Now this is a word that's made of three words. And it means with, e, if the three words are with, evil, and suffer. So it means to suffer with evil, or suffer with difficulties, or suffer with hardships. The word evil is often 
used to talk about evil things that come to you or hard things that come to you, but be a partaker. And it's the idea of acting in the face of hardship. So when you have hardship, instead of recoiling and pulling back and not moving forward, what you have to do is move forward, take a step, be bold, and keep going. And the failure to act as a partaker was holding Timothy back. He was being reticent to act. And what that does is just creates more pain. I want to read to you something that I read this week by an author or a poet. I liked it, so I want to read it to you. He said, I will not avoid the tasks of today and charge them to tomorrow, for I know that tomorrow never comes. Let me act now even though my actions may not bring happiness or success for it is better to act and to fail than to not act and to founder. Happiness in truth may not be fruit plucked by my action. Yet without action, all fruit will die on the vine. I will act now. See, what Paul is encouraging him to do is to move forward. So he tells him to look within, he tells him to look back, and he tells him to look up. And the last thing he tells him, he says, on all these things, God has given us the spirit of, of, uh, not of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, has given us the spirit that would cause us to move forward and to act. Notice the last phrase of verse 8, according to... It says, of the gospel according to the power of God. So he goes back to that word power again. This isn't the gospel of rituals and works, but of faith and of action. It's the gospel wherein the righteousness of God is revealed by which we preach our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that righteousness we are justified, we rest, we worship, we pray, and we preach. Would you stand with me, please? Father, now bless your word to our hearts. May we be encouraged by that which we've learned concerning Paul's word to Timothy. May we be moved to act, to move forward and be bold in all that we have to do, especially in our faithfulness to our Lord Jesus Christ, and to his gospel. We pray for those who are not with us, and those who are watching by live streaming. We pray that your spirit would guide and guard and protect and teach. For Christ's sake, amen.